Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. My name is Carol Long. I'm provost and senior vice president at the university, and it's my privilege to welcome you this morning to this wonderful forum and great conversation about public health and the resilience of our communities. I'd like to begin by reminding us that we are gathered on the land of the Kalapuya, who today are represented by the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians, whose relationship with this land continues to this day. We offer gratitude for the land itself, for those who have stewarded it for generations, and for the opportunity to study, learn, work, and be in community on this land. We acknowledge that our university's history, like many others, is fundamentally tied to the first colonial developments in the Willamette Valley. Finally, we respectfully acknowledge and honor past, present, and future indigenous students of Willamette. Thank you. I want to say a few words about this wonderful gathering, and then I'll let you get on with your work and conversation and the real work of the day. Um, Willamette has long had uh, strong programs in health sciences um, and has had a strong history of graduating students into various health professions. These graduates have been guided by our motto, not unto ourselves alone are we born, and contribute to the resilience and health of the communities in which they live and work. However, this new program in public health is unique in its interdisciplinary breadth and in its collaboration among the various schools of the university. As a small institution with a quality liberal arts college at the core of several outstanding graduate programs, we are able to sustain collaboration across boundaries that is not usually possible in larger institutions. We know that a, core, a, core, a key quality of resilience is the ability to connect um, fields and disciplines and conversations that are usually held in more isolation from each other. We're able to sustain that collaboration well here and we're very excited to share it and learn in it with you. This program, which integrates <coughs> excuse me, curriculum across the university and seeks to incorporate experiential and applied learning in significant ways, is reflective of some new directions at Willamette that will help build resilience for us all. Over the next de <coughs> decade, <coughs> excuse me, over the next decade, as we progress toward our 200th anniversary, it's only in 2042, it's pretty close already, right? <laughs> as we progress toward our 200th anniversary, we strive to strengthen our mission of educating diverse leaders for the fields most crucial to our community and region and to our world, and of preparing our students to translate knowledge into action and to lead lives of achievement, contribution, and meaning. Public health is one of several new, program, new and developing programs that will advance these goals. Programs in politics, policy, law, and ethics, in sustainability, in undergraduate business, and in data and computer sciences are other examples of our increasing focus on university collaboration to enhance our students' preparation to contribute to the solution of complex problems in our complex world. I want to thank Joyce Millen and Sami Basu, who will be speaking with us in a moment here, um, and the many other faculty, staff, and students who have contributed on the campus to help bring us together for this event and to build this remarkable academic program. I also want to thank all of our speakers for their willingness to help us learn this morning and to our many participants and community partners. We look forward to learning from you all today and to working with you in the future to build the health, well-being, and resilience of our community, our region, and our world. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful forum and a beautiful day. Thank you, Carol. And thank you, everybody. Uh, good morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, along with Dean Feingold, uh, and the, our Dean of the College of Liberal Arts, and Professor Sami Basu, I welcome you here to Willamette University and to this uh, Willamette's inaugural Community Health Symposium. Before we delve into the proceedings for the day, um, briefly, I'd like to introduce myself and also uh, a few logistics. So uh, I'm Joyce Millen, and I'm originally from Washington, D.C. area. 
and currently in my 15th year teaching here in the Willamette uh, Anthropology Department. Uh, before joining the faculty here, I was the director of the Institute for Health and Social Justice at Partners in Health in Boston. And before that, I worked in public health and global health in the United States and in different uh, areas of Africa. But I'm here today before you as the co-coordinator of Willamette's new program in public health ethics, advocacy, and leadership. Okay, so some logistics. The most important one, of course, is where's the bathroom? And that, uh, when you walk out of the cat cavern, and if you turn to the right, you will find the women's bathroom, and to the left is the men's, the men's bathroom. And then downstairs on either side of the building next to the doors are the two gender neutral uh, bathrooms. When you entered the cat cavern this morning, you received a card uh, that uh, indicates that we will be filming, or CCTV will be filming the proceedings today. So if, um, you didn't get a chance to see that. What it says is, uh, if you, this is sort of our shorthand way of getting your compliance and approval and uh, whatnot to be filmed. Uh, if you don't want to be filmed at all, uh, the tables 14 and 15 uh, will be avoided. Okay, so uh, you might want to get up and move to one of those tables if you don't want to be on CCTV. Um, we're doing this because we have a lot of community partners who couldn't make it here today and they wanted to actually uh, see what the proceeding, how we uh, come up with these ideas that we have in mind and take part in it in a, a different sort of way. Um, a word about who is here and the kind of environment we'd like to cultivate with you today. So we would like to be relaxed, casual, uh, to encourage lots of interaction among various contingents. We have uh, 40 different local organizations represented, leaders of 40 different organizations. We have faculty, students, and administrators. Uh, so we would uh, hope that you would introduce yourselves. It looks like many of you already have. Uh, and also, just to say, in terms of environment, there are no seat belts here, so feel free to move about the cabin. Um, there are, there's coffee and tea over there, uh, and please just uh, relax and uh, enjoy. Uh, we've social engineered the tables a slight bit, uh, you might have noticed. So hopefully there's one faculty member and one student per table. Maybe, hopefully. Uh, the point of that is, uh, is so that you get to know one another, because as we will see and as we will discuss, building social resilience is uh, about uh, becoming invested in one another's well-being first, and also collaborating uh, among sectors, but also between public and private, nonprofit, for-profit, et cetera. Throughout the symposium, there will be movement, you will see, among students and faculty. This is a regular school day for us. Uh, and so our students wanted to be here, as well as in their classrooms. So we've told them that please feel free to come and go and return as you would like, uh, so that you can participate and still uh, be in your classes, too. The folders you've been given are filled with information about our new public health program and uh, other Willamette information on the left hand, in the left-hand side. And then um, this also includes, you might see a little special 10% discount for our bookstore downstairs, available only today. Um, in the right-hand pocket, we have included a few resources we wanted to share with you from local, national, and international sources. And these include, importantly, the plan summary of the Marion County Health and Human Services Strategic Plan for 2018 to 2023, and we'll hear more about that later. Um, also, the president of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials 2019 Challenge for Building Healthy and Resilient Communities is definitely worth reading, and a brief summation of the World Health Organization's Health in All Policies report. This last report concretizes something that I suspect all of us know well, that health is determined by a vast array of historic and current biological, sociocultural, socio political, environmental, and economic factors. We have reproduced other materials as well and helpful reports uh, for you to peruse on your tables as well as on the two resource tables in the back corner there. Um, during breaks and lunch and whatnot, we hope you'll look at those. Uh, thank you very, very much for joining us today at the end of this significant week, uh, which began on Monday uh, at the United Nations, where adults the world over were put to shame by a 16-year-old Greta Thunberg. 
um, Turnberg. Uh, and then yesterday, ongoing testimonies and deliber deliberations in the offices and corridors of power in Washington, D.C. But amid all the newsworthy events of this week, did you also learn that 194 countries signed on, including the United States, signed on to a truly historic United Nations declaration, the Declaration on the Universal Health Coverage, pledging commitments to provide all of their citizens access to affordable health care. Wow, what a laudable goal and a truly odd disconnect from local realities and current domestic political agendas. In any case, the news was clearly lost in the fray, but we should probably be attentive to it, this declaration, and its implications for our community. But first, why have we convened this symposium? Good morning. Um, so my name is Sammy Basu. Um, I received my PhD from Princeton the uh, Willamette of the East. Um, and for the past uh, 25 years or so, I was in a, the formerly uh, politics department. I'm now in the history department, presumably for the next 25 years. Um, and what I thought I would do is, is uh, tell you why we've convened the symposium. So the uh, first thing, the first purpose, is really as a kind of coming out party. Uh, we've launched a new academic program. Um, and its novelty uh, arises in a couple of respects. One is that it's a collaboration across the schools of Willamette University. It's an undergraduate program in which students will have access to uh, uh, graduate courses. Um, but the other is that we're really trying to take the mission of the university very seriously. Um, Willamette has long had a mission of service, um, and there is actually a storied history of a number of academic departments keen to ensure that their majors uh, go out into the community. Um, and for us, taking this to the next level is really to think about an academic program that is fundamentally community-facing. So the first uh, task, the first purpose of the symposium is, is to sort of come out as a, a new academic program. Um, the second function, second purpose, um, and this is to some extent what uh, the first table discussion will be about, is to recognize and celebrate and facilitate conversation among community partners. Um, we're academics, and so for us, uh, thinking about concepts and theory is quite important, and, and one of the concepts that we uh, have come to focus on is the notion of community resilience uh, in all of the ways in which it might be understood. Um, and so what we're going to do is encourage you uh, during the first table discussion to actually sort of think about this concept and think about what work we've done in the community, what work we can do, how we might collaborate more effectively. The third purpose, um, having sort of identified and acknowledged the good work that is, is being done, is to seek the wisdom and counsel of you as public health practitioners in, in various ways. Um, as uh, uh, co-developers of this new academic program. That is, we're, we're really keen to understand from you uh, what sorts of students should this program be producing, what sorts of skills and capacities should they be able to manifest uh, if they are going to be value-adding members of your organization, both while they're here in college, but, but really uh, after graduation when they sort of enter the public health field. Okay, so those are the three purposes of the symposium. Uh, public health, here we are. Uh, secondly, let's talk about the good work that's being done and how we can do it better, how we can do more of it. And third, uh, tell us what you need from the young people who might then enter into your organizations in various capacities. Um, let me shift then and, and introduce our first speaker. Um, though much of the uh, morning will be spent uh, really at the level of table discussions, uh, we, we did want to sort of start off in a properly august way. Um, and for that purpose, our first speaker is Senator Elizabeth Steiner Hayward. Senator Hayward is a, an adjunct associate professor of family medicine at OHSU. She has served as the state senator for Northwest Portland and Beaverton since 2012. Uh, she is awesome. Uh, <laughs> 
I, I, I will mention that among the work that she's done, uh, raising the legal age for purchasing tobacco products to 21, increasing statewide vaccination rates, and addressing the opioid epidemic head on through behavioral health treatment programs and addressing price transparency in pharmaceutical drugs. Please welcome Senator Hayward. One of the questions I get a lot is, you decided you want to be a doctor when you were four, which is true that I did, and you're, you've had a pretty successful career in medicine, so why in the world did you decide to leave that being your primary work and go to the legislature? And I'm going to guess that the reason I did it is the reason that all of you are here. Who among you believes that Oregon can be the healthiest state in the nation? Who among you believes that we have work to do to get us there? <laughs> right? Okay. So, then I'm going to tell you why I think, I thought, and I still think I have something to offer and I think really resonates with the theme of this meeting. As a family physician, I look at the world in a very matrixed way. Right? I don't think that healthcare is over here and education is over there and environmental issues are here and the economy is over there. I think they're all kind of connected. And for any of you who've been in my office, which some of you have, you know that I have one of those children's toys on my desk that has those bars with the colored balls and they're all connected by elastics and if you push one part of it, they all move. And I use that as a model to talk about why I'm here and why I'm doing this work. Because I firmly believe that people can't be healthy if they're not well educated and they can't be well educated if they're not healthy and we can't have a robust sustainable economy if we don't have healthy well educated people living in a clean environment where they can get to work in a timely fashion without it costing them a fortune they can have safe affordable housing they all have food security and access to high quality food at an affordable price et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. right and all of these intersect completely and I don't think anybody in this room would disagree with any of that, right? Okay, good. So we're all on the same ground here, which is a great place to start. Now, what's it gonna take to get us there? In your packets, you have a little sheet that describes the World Health Organization's Health in All Policies, or HIAP philosophy. And one of the things that has always been a question that I think a lot of us wrestle with is when we think about a curriculum, for example, and I thought about this when I was, my primary work was teaching in the medical school at OHSU. Do we, for example, think about addressing cultural issues, about cultural awareness, about cultural sensitivity as its own curriculum, or do we think about integrating it into every piece of curriculum? And I see some heads nodding saying we should integrate it, right? Because it has more meaning if we think about it in the context of whatever else it is that we're teaching or thinking about on a given day. And that's the whole point of the WHO policy that we should be thinking about health in every policy we do, right? So for example, this year when we were working on the Student Success Act that we passed in the legislature, we were really thinking about mental health in our schools and trying to understand why children were struggling so much more than they were in previous years. Maybe we're just doing a better job identifying it, which is great, Maybe there's some environmental factors that are contributing to the high levels of anxiety, depression, all those kinds of things that we're seeing in our young people today. Regardless, we need to have the people on the ground, the skilled professionals on the ground, who can help students get past those challenges, integrate them, and be successful in whatever it is that they choose to do. Right? And that is an example of health in all policies. And it is for that reason, from the, the things that I've talked, heard from Joyce and that I'm hearing this morning, that all of you have come together because you understand that for us to be successful, we have to think about health in a much broader sense than what happens in my office when I've got my doctor hat on, right? And we know, in fact, that only 10% of health happens in a traditional healthcare setting. The vast majority of it occurs in our schools and on our playgrounds and on the job and on our roads, in our classrooms, and everywhere else that people live and work and play and learn every single day, right? And again, the whole point about programs like this that are interdisciplinary is to understand that no longer can we think about any of these subjects separately. But if the world has taught us anything, it has taught us that we have to think 
about things using the wisdom of crowds. Have anybody read that book, that great book called The Wisdom of Crowds? It's awesome. If you haven't, you should. Um, the whole point is if you assemble people who all kind of think alike and have the same expertise around a table, you're never going to solve big problems, right? And the point that was made that we have tables here where we have faculty and students and people from community organizations of every stripe, for-profit, non-profit, government, at every single table, that's because all of us have something to contribute, something important, a perspective, an idea. And what I want to encourage each and every one of you to do is to listen as more carefully to the people who are different from you than the people who are the same as you. Because it is the people who are different from us who can teach us more than we can ever possibly imagine. And it is only through listening to people who are different from us that we will be able to solve the very challenging problems that I think each and every one of you is committed to solving, to helping Oregon and ultimately the rest of the nation be as healthy as possible in every sense of that word. Physical, spiritual, mental, whole life health, right? Because it's not just whether your blood pressure is under good control or your cholesterol is low or your heart rate's good. It's about do you feel integrated as a whole person? Can you do the things you want to do to live a healthy, productive life? And those are the things you want to do. And so we need to tap into the energy of our young people, whether it's Greta, whose last name I can't pronounce as well as Joyce can, um, um, talking as a 16-year-old to the United Nations about her passion for addressing one of the, I would argue, the most pressing problem we face today, which is climate change or whether it's the students in this room or across this campus who have come to a place like Willamette because they believe they can be part of the future, the positive future of our state and our country. And tapping into that energy and enthusiasm and the ability to think about things without coming in with a lot of preconceived notions, they are the people who can do that better than old folks like me, right? We have wisdom, we have experience, we have perspective. Our younger colleagues, and I call each and every one of you my colleagues in solving these pressing problems, whether you're straight in the, when you're in your first month and a half of college or you've been teaching at this university for 25 years, you are all my colleagues and you should all consider yourself colleagues to each other. And it is only when we tap into all of that energy, all of those ideas, all of that enthusiasm, all of that experience that we can come together to solve these incredibly challenging problems. So my question for you is, what's your BHAG? What's your big, hairy, audacious goal? When you came to this conference today, what were you thinking, if this goes well, this is what we could get done, right? And as you go through your day today, I urge you, and take out from this meeting, I urge you to think about what is that big, hairy, audacious goal? Where could we be in 10 years if we really come together with the passion that we brought to this room? If we really listen to every voice that we can possibly hear to understand new ways to approach these problems, whether it's using the traditions of the first peoples who lived on this land long before people who looked like me did, or the wisdom of people who come from cultures all across the world and bring different traditions of healing and hope and education to the table and think, as a journalist does, what are our five W's? Why? The first and foremost is why are we doing this? What is our why? Not what are we going to do, not how are we going to do it, but why do we care so deeply that we're willing to spend a day in this room with other people talking about really important topics and taking time away from our other really important work to do this? Who do we need to bring to the table to help us solve these problems? Let's make sure it's not the same group of people over and over and over again. Let's look for the fresh voices, for the new voices, for the new perspectives who can make a difference in helping us come together and solve these problems. When do we need to do all this? Well, obviously now, but what kind of sequence do we need to do it? And we all know that old Chinese proverb, you know, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. 
And one of the things I've learned as a legislator is half a loaf is decidedly better than none. I'll take a piece of policy that gets me a big step toward where I want to be rather than take nothing because I didn't get everything I wanted. And I think anybody who's had to take on a really big, audacious goal has to understand that it is a series of smaller goals a long way. And we have to, we, we, I'm Jewish and we're taught, and it's really important as we think about this going into our new year, which begins on Sunday night, that it's not up to us to finish the work, it's up to us to start it. We have to be the ones to start it. And even if we know that we're not the ones who are gonna be sitting under that tree, we've gotta plant that seed. And that's what we can do together when we come together. We have to understand where we wanna be 10 years from now. Where do we wanna be in 2042 when Willamette's celebrating its anniversary? Where do we wanna be when my grandchildren and the youngest person in this room's grandchildren are thriving, we hope, in Oregon, the United States, and wherever they choose to go in the world? So I want to thank each and every one of you for taking the time to understand that we have to come together in these ways to refresh our enthusiasm, to build new networks, to connect with people who we would otherwise never meet, and understand how we can create those synergies and that build on that enthusiasm together to solve these ginormous problems by having big, hairy, audacious goals. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Senator. And thank you for coming all the way down here. For this. Yeah. My apologies that I can't stay. Yeah. Um, I would now like to introduce two very important people in our community um, who many of you already know. Carrie Mahler, the Administrator of Marion County Health and Human Services, and Katrina Rothenberger, the Director of Marion County Public Health Department. Good morning, everybody. That is a really tough act to follow. Thank you, Senator, for your very inspiring and compelling words. I appreciate it. My pleasure. I really appreciate the invitation. So um, just a few words about what uh, Marion County Health and Human Services role and connection is to this work. Um, I am Carrie Muller, and I'm the administrator of the uh, Health Department, Health and Human Services Department, and under that is our public health program. Katrina is going to talk a bit more about that. The, um, as the uh, public health administrator, I am and carry a really a profound burden and responsibility of the whole health of this community. As the local public health authority designated to me by the Board of Commissioners, we are tasked with um, the really aspirational goals that we uh, just heard to today. So uh, the uh, Board of Commissioners um, uh, designates to me the oversight of policy in this community, in this county, public health policy, uh, really big things like um, water control and setting policy around that. Um, I'm thinking about the things that are very, very foremost in my mind today. We have a goal and a responsibility around disease prevention and wellness in this community. And uh, the, if, you're have been, um, if you're aware, there's a big shift in Oregon right now to modernize the public health system. And what that means for us as the local health authority, it means um, ensuring that every person in this community I feel compelled to say this again. Every person in this community has access to high quality health services, uh, behavioral health services. Um, I was this morning at a conference around addiction treatment and the opioid crisis. So I'm thinking about that particularly uh, at our prevention work that we're doing in this community to ensure that people live the best lives they possibly can. You'll see that in our strategic plan and our mission here. Um, so disease prevention, and, but if we look back to sort of the origins of public health, um, it's, um, it's moving to me to think about how profound the public health work, um, the profound impact it's had in our community and in our world. Think about things like um, helmets. Uh, 
I mean, that's a public health initiative, ensuring that every child on a bike, every adult um, on a motorcycle, every adult on a bike uh, gets to someplace a safety, safely, and that's a prevention effort. Uh, the campaign around drunk driving and reducing uh, the incidence of death and, and uh, related to drunk driving, that's a public health initiative, water quality, environment. Uh, so health and human services in the public health department is has a direct relationship um, to that work. So um, we're really excited about what modernization does. It, it talks, it moves us to a population base and health equity lens, and I think that's exactly where we need to be. We, I'm very proud of the health services we provide in the um, public health department. We see moms, we see women, we see um, people who come and want to know that the restaurant they eat at is uh, uh, safe. I mean, we, we do all of that work, but we're really uh, pivoting to ensure that every person in our community has access to high quality health services and that we think about it as a population. So um, when we can serve uh, people in their community and a population, so the incidence of tuberculosis, maybe measles, um, are fewer and fewer in this community, um, then I think we've taken a significant step at uh, achieving um, a start in this uh, work um, and the inspirational uh, uh, challenge for all of us to continue to come together. So our relationship to you all, I am so excited about this, that in this community with the passion and the commitment that we have, we get to engage with you all and that you will help us in this work. So bravo to you all for taking this on and I'm so excited about our ongoing partnership. Katrina? Um, thank you, Carrie. As Carrie mentioned, I'm Katrina Rothenberger, and um, I get the privilege of uh, leading our health department, but I don't have the responsibility of the administrator, which is um, I'm very thankful for. It is quite uh, the responsibility. Um, I'm excited to be here today to express my gratitude to Willamette and this new public health ethics advocacy and leadership program that's right here in Salem. Uh, the partnership between academia and and, local, and the local public health authority uh, will not only bring relevance to the public health education, but also develop our current and future public health workforce. I'm looking forward to hearing your ideas today on how we can engage in joint education, research, and practice so that we can begin to build the evidence base for public health right in our own community and better deliver the foundational uh, public health programs and capabilities here in Oregon. And public health is a system, so we can't really do our work well without strong relationships between hospitals, community nonprofits. Um, lab we have so many partners, uh, school districts, laboratories, um, fire and EMS. It's, it's all a system, and we have to work well together. Um, and if you look in your folders, you'll see our 2018 and 23 strategic plan. Imperative number two, drive systemic change to support healthy communities. So I'm hoping that each one of you will help us think about how we can partner with Willamette University as our local public health system to drive systemic change for a healthy community. You'll see our community health assessment back on the back table that was just published in 2019. And that really helped us identify three issues that our community prioritized as behavioral health supports, housing, and substance use. So these are the three priorities that our community identified as issues that we really need to work on together. So uh, partnering with Willamette University and all of you to make that happen. Um, I've, I really look forward to the discussion today and hopeful that we can make some momentum on those strategic issues. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Katrina. This would not be a symposium, a community health symposium, without words from our mayor. So I'd like to introduce to you Mayor Chuck Bennett, currently serving his second term as mayor. And for his bio, I refer to the back side of your program. Uh, mayor Bennett has been uh, phenomenal in our community, over 25 years of incredible service to this community. So, Mayor Bennett.
thank you very much. Uh, it's always uh, it's always a pleasure to get to come over to Willamette. I graduated from this school in 1970. I spent a lot of time here in the Cat Cavern, like many college students of my era, playing bridge. It was uh, we uh, we spent a great deal of time here and thoroughly enjoyed. It. I really am thrilled to be included. Uh, in uh, this inaugural Community Health Symposium, and particularly uh, as Willamette launches uh, this new academic program on health ethics, advocacy, and leadership. Uh, I graduated, I mentioned that in 1970, I graduated in English, so as I was educated here, I went into journalism, the legislature, lobbying, and now mayor of Salem. So it all kind of fit together for me. I, so I know how Willamette does this and uh, how they can do it out of English without encapsulating all the possibilities, I don't know, but they've apparently found a way to describe an effort that I think is really exciting. Uh, before I go any further, I do want to take just a, a personal moment uh, to, to introduce uh, Jackie Leung, who is a a uh, fellow member of the Salem City Council. Jackie, uh, thank you for being here. When I first heard about this program, I, I really was quite excited. This is something that interests me uh, a great deal and in a whole variety of ways. And I'm going to talk to you about it on a certain slice here in the city. But I want to... Uh, uh, sort of emphasize there's a lot of activity in your city related to issues that would be included in an academic program like this. And I think at some of the tables you're sitting, I can see some of our folks uh, who will share with you the kind of activity. But I, when I uh, began thinking about an issue area and talking to you, uh, I realize you don't get this gray hair by accident. You, you really actually have to get old. And I am, I'm 71 years old. Uh, I've lived in Salem for about 52 years. Uh, and I have been active, I'm still active, I'm still engaged, I'm still thoroughly enjoying it. But the reality to me was, and I, I included in uh, a state of the city uh, a year or two ago, we really have to get serious about dealing with aging in place, with sort of an age-friendly city, whether it's for young people, it's nice, for middle-aged people coming out of school, spending their careers, that's nice too. But for old people, I was very, very concerned because I could see myself uh, apparently heading into that, uh, into that area. So in September of 2017, uh, a group of individuals of various ages and expertise were charged with evaluating uh, Salem's current situation uh, and how it functions as an age-friendly community really based on eight identified uh, livability domains. Transportation, social participation, communication and technology, housing, outdoor spaces, public buildings, civil engagement, volunteerism, and uh, work after 50, as well as health. And I think it's important that, that you understand what this might look like in a public policy arena, uh, particularly for students, but I know for others, that in fact a city which really specializes in cops, fire, water, sewer, streets, parking tickets, and uh, dealing with homeless issues, we also have to take on some other uh, really challenging is issues. So this age-friendly assessment team, uh, working with AARP, which had a national program we discovered as we got going ourselves, had a national program that would assist us in working our way through this, took this issue on through a whole series. And I don't know if any of you were involved, none of you look old enough to be involved, but uh, 
Uh, this was organized into community forums, focus groups, online surveys, interviews, and resource fairs. That's how we took on this issue. The project itself uh, was a cooperation be, be, between Center 50 Plus, which is uh, a u pretty unique program in the country. It's a city-sponsored, city-operated uh, senior, senior center, although I, I will tell you 50 is not very senior from my perspective, but uh, they're up on uh, Fairgrounds Road, kind of in the old Hollywood district, for those of you who've been here a while. And it became a really interesting uh, batch of work. It looked at the needs of the population we were looking at through a whole range of lenses and began to create a community of people focused on this discussion that met regularly as they began to develop it. What we found out, and I'll, I'll kind of just give you the end first, Salem's a great place to get old, and I can attest to that. I really can. It is a place that really does meet a whole series of needs. In fact, I got an email, surprisingly, uh, yesterday from some outfit telling me that Salem is the 79th best city in the United States to grow old, which I thought was great. We are behind, uh, I think, God, I'm trying to remember which one, Beaverton would be a great place to grow. If you want a better place to grow old, apparently in Oregon, go to Beaverton, so, uh, which kind of surprised me. Uh, but I hope a, a program like you're looking at here at Willamette will assist in dealing with issues like this. Let me give you a sense of why this is so critical, because it is often, you know, well, it's just sort of, there's an age group passing through. There was a baby boom. There truly was a baby boom that occurred in the United States after the war. By 2035, 24% of the population of Marion and Polk counties will, will be over 60 years old. That's compared to only 16% in the year 2000. It is not our weather attracting people. It is all of us here aging and being prepared to be able to do that in place. Uh, last year, just to give you an example of kind of the kinds of policy issues we're dealing with, the city serves, in, and I won't go into the details of this, but a conduit for bond measures for some health. It's kind of a health authority bond measure, which assists the hospital in getting tax exempt bonds. They came to the city just this past week for $305 million to add 150 new beds at the hospital in anticipation of our aging population. And if you kind of listen to what, if you unpack what I started to describe, you begin to see how government advocacy, uh, go how government's role coupled with the healthcare system looking at the demographics developed by, in many cases, by Portland State University have resulted in a tremendous decision for this community and the reality that we're going to be prepared as we move forward in this area. I think the question for all of us uh, to contemplate is what will the graduates of this program bring to this community, to our community, whether it's our Salem, our Oregon, our region, and if you go any further, please come back, because we need you, uh, to assist us in meeting just that challenge. That doesn't include the other challenges you'll all talk about. As I look out over the, the room, I see a, a whole range of groups that are involved in this. How will we have in Salem a robust a system of primary care and specialty advisors available to this burgeoning population. Again, uh, about 25% of our population and our population, which is currently 170,000, is going to increase by over 60,000 over that same time period. We're starting to talk about an awful lot of people. We need a more holistic approach to health care and treatment who will guide us into that approach? Who will convince people 
don't vape, don't smoke, eat right, be prepared to live a longer life because you're going to, and you don't want to do it sitting in the barca lounge or watching TV. You're going to need to be more engaged than that, that we have the right number of hospital beds and that we keep up with it. 150 isn't going to make it, but it's a great start that we have closer partnerships among providers and access to the whole, and this is, again, beyond my, I won't go into any kind, just some digital access that is going to be absolutely essential to deal with the kind of health care we're going to want to have in this community. We know that this elderly population is going to need tremendous health care. It's going to need advocacy. And I can't tell you how pleased I am that Willamette University, after its 150th year, is heading into this area. Remember, first medical school in Oregon was here at Willamette before it moved north to the hill. And so I, I, hope, uh, I hope we can all work together. And uh, I, I know Willamette is a tremendous partner to this community. So. Uh, congratulations for the, the really insightful decision to go into this area. Thank you very much. So uh, could I ask you all again to uh, join me in thanking all of our introductory speakers. Um, The other thing I'd like to do before uh, saying some introductory uh, and, and somewhat more detailed remarks about the new program, the new academic program, is actually to take, take Senator Steiner Hayward's cue uh, and, and do a bit of social engineering of the tables because the success of the table discussions, uh, one and two, really, really depend on this. So if you are a student, would you stand up, please? Now, if you are sitting at a table with adults, you can sit down. The rest of you have to go find a new table. Now, adults, if you are at a, at a table that is full of adults that you know well, would you stand up? Come on. As I've, I've seen, if you, if you are an adult sitting at a table with people you know well, you need to go sit at a different table. <laughs> I'll give you a second. I'll come this way. Okay. Um, and a similar request for faculty. Um, I, so both students and faculty will need to come and go, but if you are a faculty member, and you're clinging to the outer edges of the room, singing, sitting at a table only with students, could you move? We optimally want tables that are representing a variety of things, uh, age, professional relationship to public health, and so on. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so I want to say just a couple of words about this new academic program. Um, it's a public health program. It's a public health program that we have chosen to name uh, and give the acronym FEEL, uh, Public Health Ethics, Advocacy, and Leadership. Now, why uh, those dimensions? Um, in the first place, it's, it seemed to us, and has seemed to us for a long time, that a liberal arts college is really a terrific venue from which to produce uh, public health professionals because the reality of being effective in public health from our sort of academic and theoretical perspective is that you actually need to know a lot about a variety of domains. You need to be able to bring to bear both high structural and socioeconomic understanding of client populations in their specificity and individuality. 
Um, and so we've wanted to actually launch this program and, and, and start this program at Willamette for a number of years. Uh, the reality is as a small school, uh, as, a, as a small undergraduate college and a small private university, we needed to have enough uh, uh, folks, enough faculty doing the right sorts of academic work that we would know that there's enough courses being offered. And, and part of the timing of this uh, uh, launch is that in fact we now have such faculty in place and a real array of courses. Um, and the other thing that, it, that is really new for us as a university is a, is a kind of new commitment to, to work across the schools and to really think about how as an academic program we can uh, both do undergraduate and prepare students for kind of graduate level specialization and focus. But if I come back to these three words, ethics, advocacy, and leadership, um, one of the, uh, I think, sort of distinctive roles that that the academy can play is to continue to furnish people who go out into public health with a kind of self-conscious theoretical and philosophical basis in ethics. That is being able to make arguments about what sorts of interventions should go forward and why under what circumstances we think will be more effective, more likely to occur, more likely to gain adherence uh, if, if, if the, the students that we hope to produce can actually talk ethically about the uh, judgments that they're making, not just cost-benefit analysis, but ethical analysis. Second, advocacy. So from our perspective, the, the value of advocacy is that public health is not evenly distributed across a population. It's not evenly distributed across our community. Um, there are particular f sorts of vulnerabilities, there are particular types of challenges that are faced by particular demographic cohorts. Um, and so training students to be aware of those discrepancies, training students to be prepared to advocate in uh, sort of appropriate, informed, uh, culturally sensitive ways uh, on behalf of these communities, with these communities, uh, speaking with them, for them, uh, helping them to make the case for the needs that they have, uh, we feel is quite important. So that's advocacy. Um, and leadership. So leadership we mean both in the grand sense that, that we do hope that some of our, uh, uh, the graduates of our new program will be leaders at the apex of organizations, including the sorts of organizations that you're now currently involved with. But I think we also mean leadership in the everyday sense, uh, which is, how can you be a member of a team that is actually uh, an agent of change, that actually initiates action that gets accomplished? Um, and so leadership doesn't have to be, uh, you know, the, the, the notion of a kind of top-down direction of an organization, but it, it's really about enabling um, and, and helping to get things done. So that role of leadership is, is also quite important to us. Um, so, as I said, uh, part of what's, what's new about uh, this program is the effort to uh, coordinate across the schools, the undergraduate schools and the two professional schools. Um, I, I will say that there's a third uh, uh, graduate school that, that uh, has arrived at Willamette and we look forward to working with them. We don't have a representative uh, from the Claremont School of Theology, but one of the domains that, that Prepared to speak? Are you prepared to speak? No? Okay. <laughs> um, and, and so uh, something that we won't talk about, but I think in future versions of a meeting like this we will, is spiritual counseling is another sort of dimension of uh, uh, this program going forward. Um, but we do have two individuals, and I'll let them uh, introduce themselves and, and talk a little bit about uh, the role of their schools, both narrowly and broadly, in relation to public health. Well, good morning. It's wonderful to see you all here. Uh, my name is Tim Johnson. I'm a faculty member at the Atkinson Graduate School of Management just across the way over there uh, across Winter Street. And, you know, I'm delighted to get a chance to be able to engage with all of you because in some ways the Atkinson School's mission has always been about bringing together different sectors of the community. It's done it mainly through a vision of trying to get the not-for-profit sector, the public sector, and the private sector to work together in collaborative ways and then also to recognize that the managers who lead in each of those different areas of the, our economy 
share a common skill set. And our goal at the Atkinson School is to cultivate that skill set. And when I think about all the conversations this morning where, you know, the, the folks who have taken up to this podium have spoken about the wide range of activities that are involved in public health initiatives, I think about the Atkinson School providing an opportunity to fill the intellectual infrastructure that's needed in order to carry out those wide, diverse range of initiatives. You know, how are we going to be able to finance those initiatives? How are we going to motivate people in order to engage in them? lead those folks in those initiatives? How are we going to account for those resources that we gather in order to complete them? These are all the types of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, challenges that we think about at the Atkinson School on a daily basis. Our goal is to cultivate managers who have strong sense of those managerial disciplines and then are able to go out in the community, carry out a diverse range of initiatives of the type that the public health community would be interested in following through with and doing so in a way that's in keeping with the, the goals of this program, thinking about ethics, advocacy, and leadership at the core of those initiatives. And so how do we do that? Well, at the Atkinson School, we have a variety of ways that the community can engage with us. It's a, a range of programs that really target at different types of students that we could share our educational mission with. The, and I'm going to kind of work through this, uh, this list of programs because it's a fairly lengthy list in a way where I think first about the folks in the wider community who might engage with the school more episodically at a part-time basis and then kind of move into the, the folks who would be seated here on campus on a daily basis engaging with the Atkinson School. So, you know, what would be the way that you could engage with um, the Atkinson School if you're a member of the public health community but not apt to be a full-time student here on campus? Well, we have a number of programs that would allow you to do that. One is our part-time MBA program. This is one that meets in the evenings each week. It goes through the core managerial disciplines, then also uh, beginning this year is offering a wider range of elective opportunities, and it's targeted at making sure that managers across any sector of the economy gain a firm skill set in those key disciplines that are necessary in order to lead an organization, understand how to manage the resources of an organization, and run its operations. That's a, a program that meets uh, on an evening basis. Uh, during, uh, during the daytime, uh, once a week, we also have certificate offerings that are uh, available through our Executive Development Center. We've this year just rolled out a certificate in data science. It meets on Saturdays up in Portland. And here it would be a, a program when I think about public health applications, one that allows a manager to think about the ways that data are gathered from community sources, engineered, that is, you know, uh, uh, organized in ways that can be then analyzed and then carried out through um, sophisticated computer science tools to examine whether or not insights can be drawn from those data. So this certificate program is a new opportunity to interface with the public health community uh, primarily through you know, disciplines like epidemiology. We also have uh, uh, managerial offerings through our executive development center that also might be of interest. So for those of you from public agencies, we, uh, you ought to know that we have a certificate in public management that we offer on Fridays throughout the year. It's uh, a credential that allows you to be able to show your ability to organize um, resources in your, uh, your agencies, to be able to uh, think about the broad leadership concerns that might be going on therein. And we have our full-time faculty and as well experts in the community uh, teaching it. And so it's another way in which you know, those of you who might not be able to be on campus on a daily basis basis, uh, but have an interest in public health and the ways that you might uh, organize around that to engage with the Atkinson School and Willamette on the whole. If you have you know, more time uh, to invest in cultivating the types of managerial uh, knowledge and skills that uh, uh, would be in support of public health initiatives. Then our full-time MBA program um, that takes place uh, across the academic calendar would be of interest. Um, it's primarily aimed towards students who have just completed an undergraduate degree or are interested in building a skill set for the workplace earlier in their career. And so for those of you running organizations in which you might want to develop talent uh, early on in order to take on greater leadership roles uh, in, in future years, this program might be a way to support those individuals to step out of the workplace for a number of years, gain these types of skills that will help in the long term. Um, also, for students in the room, um, uh, those of you who are undergraduates should know that the Atkinson School has this year rolled out a business minor, and its courses will fit into the 
public health uh, program itself formally. And so you'll be able to take the coursework that will allow you to take detailed knowledge of public health and apply it out in the community to manage organizations, to manage um, uh, endeavors that are gonna be about tangibly going out and uh, helping make the community one with greater levels of well-being. So these are the ways that uh, the public health program and all of uh, uh, you out in the public health community, I think, can engage with the Atkinson School. If you have any questions about it, feel free to reach out to me. My information will be readily available on the websites associated with this program, as well as the Atkinson School's websites. And I'd be delighted to see some of you in the future in our courses or engaging with us in various ways. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Paul Diller. I teach at the law school. I've been on the faculty for almost 15 years. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the law school's potential contributions to FEEL. Uh, so just to orient everybody, if you're not a frequent visitor to Willamette, the law school is just right across Winter Street, just to the uh, west of the main campus here. Uh, and so I'll talk about some of the courses we offer at the school, uh, some of the extracurriculars, you might call it, that we offer. Uh, and then maybe some future possibilities that uh, I'll leave you with for discussion and uh, contemplation as we move this program along. Um, as far as courses, we have three core courses and then lots of others that are relevant to uh, public health and health. So I teach, and I think this is why I've been invited to speak, I teach our public health law course. Uh, and so that's a course that really focuses on the government's authority to regulate uh, and then breaks that down uh, in terms of federalism, so we look at the federal uh, role, state role, and local role in regulating public health. Um, we also look across governments at the role of administrative agencies and how they interact with uh, the legislature and the judiciary. Um, we deal with a lot of uh, constitutional rights like uh, that, that, that have an impact on public health law regulation, uh, like freedom of religion, privacy, substantive due process, uh, and increasingly the First Amendment, freedom of speech. Um, we, uh, we look at specific areas of regulation like vaccines, fluoride, tobacco, uh, drugs and alcohol, um, uh, obesity prevention, uh, and firearms, uh, and how government regulation uh, might or can impact uh, public health. Um, we also are lucky to have on our uh, faculty, uh, in, a, in a broad sense, um, uh, an adjunct professor, Bruce Howell, uh, who's been with us for going on five years now. Um, Bruce is a longtime healthcare lawyer, uh, practiced for decades in uh, Texas uh, and Oregon, um, and he's sort of semi-retired and enjoying running now his own practice after having been a, a partner at a large law firm uh, and then spending a lot of time here uh, on campus. Uh, and so uh, I'm reading from notes here because these are his courses uh, that he teaches very well, but I'll try to summarize them, do them justice. Uh, he teaches health law and policy. That's kind of our main health law course as opposed to public health law, uh, where he covers issues like uh, the insurance and financing of health care, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, TRICARE, hospitals and taxation, including uh, how for-profit and non-profit hospitals are taxed or, or not taxed uh, differently. Um, patient care issues, health privacy, medical records, um, the Affordable Care Act, and its implementation. Um, Bruce also teaches um, a medical malpractice course as a standalone course. I think that's covered to some extent in his healthcare law and policy. Uh, but medical malpractice uh, obviously deals with you know, the treatment relationship between uh, the physician and the patient, uh, physician liability, institutional liability, uh, damages and settlement, uh, HIPAA, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996, those forms you always sign uh, at the doctor's office. Uh, they always seem to update them every year when I go. Um, uh, and confidentiality issues. So those are just our core three courses. We could always add more. That's something we could think about uh, and talk about as an institution. Um, I should mention these courses are increasingly available to not just law students but also undergrads as the university has worked to sync up the schedules of the of the three and now four schools uh, and also uh, business students. Um, one of the things I love about teaching public health law and um, uh, being involved in the discipline of public health is that it is 
totally immodest. You know, public health says everything impacts public health, you know. Uh, and so if you think about it, pretty much every course at this university relates to public health in some way. But certainly lots of courses at the law school are related to public health. And so let me just name a few uh, that are more obvious, but, you know, it's, it's, it's not even a, a complete list. Constitutional law one and two, okay, you know, the, whether or not the Affordable Care Act could stand was a matter of constitutional law, uh, as, as we're well aware of. Administrative law. Most regulations get actually promulgated by administrative agencies like the FDA or you have uh, their kind of equivalents at the state and local level. Uh, Native American law, you know, Native American health is, is a big issue and we have a course in, in kind of all Native American law issues. Torts, of course, that's the foundation of medical malpractice. Uh, and then all the kinds of skills courses that would be relevant to somebody working in this field as a lawyer uh, or not as a lawyer, like negotiation, mediation, alternative dispute resolution, uh, and, and those kinds of classes. Uh, so that's just the coursework. What else do we have going on? Well, we have a very robust uh, externship program, and uh, I didn't have a chance to check, but I'm 95% I'm sure we have placed our students in uh, jobs where they have worked on uh, health care issues uh, or public health issues like with county health departments, county legal departments, which usually advise the county health departments. Um, we have a health law society that's one of our more active student groups. They routinely bring in uh, high profile speakers uh, and help students who are interested in moving on to um, that field. Uh, and now what about the future? Uh, what might we think about for the future? And these are just my ideas or ideas I've discussed with uh, some other folks in the room or some other folks at the university, uh, but would take a lot of discussion and, and, um, and eventually resources to implement. Uh, one possibility is a JD, MPH, MPH, JD, Juris Doctor, MPH, Master of Public Health. There is not one school in Oregon that currently offers that. Uh, that could be a comparative advantage here. Um, we don't have a public health school at the moment. Who knows, maybe we will one day. Uh, but there is one in Corvallis. Uh, at OSU, that's a potential partnership. Um, LLM in public health, we don't have that right now. That's a, an advanced legal degree, um, but there are several schools that, that have that. That could be an area for um, exploration in the future that we could link into the field um, program. Um, an increasing uh, area of interest to those in the public health law field is medical legal partnerships, um, recognizing the interrelationship of medical issues with legal issues. You know, like somebody getting evicted or being caught up in the criminal justice system or what have you. And so uh, an increasing involvement, whether from our clinical law program uh, or other opportunities for students uh, to participate in, in those. Um, and then a very ambitious goal that I'm on the steering committee of right now, uh, there's a kind of an unrooted idea right now to form a Oregon Public Health Law Center. Uh, I say it's unrooted because we don't have money in a place. Uh, but it's an idea, and there are a lot of people very interested in this. Could Willamette be the place? Maybe. Okay. Uh, but the idea would be to have um, kind of a one-stop shop that would have at least to start an attorney and a researcher to be a resource to uh, county health departments, state agencies, the legislature, uh, other researchers uh, about the impact of programs on public health in Oregon. Um, that would be a long way down the road, but it, I think it's a great idea and something we should think about. Um, and talk about. So uh, those are just some ideas and some of what's going on. Um, I'm available at the law school. Uh, my uh, email address is, you can easily find it, uh, pdiller at willamette.edu. Uh, and I'd love to talk to any of you who are interested and uh, really looking forward to the conversations. Thank you very much. So um, the new academic program in, in, uh, called FEEL is part of a, a kind of university-wide, uh, I think, effort to um, have a larger presence in terms of uh, the development and growth, professional development certainly, um, of public health. Um, let, let me second the comment that was made and say that from an undergraduate perspective, uh, what we're keen to do is to uh, get our students to understand that, that uh, health figures in a wide array of policies and a wide domain uh, at various levels of intervention. 
um, and that actually sort of understanding uh, where, what the conditions of health are is also predicated on uh, being familiar and able to engage with a wide array of determinants. The undergraduate program, uh, in terms of the faculty at Willamette, uh, uh, has Joyce and myself as core faculty, uh, but vitally uh, a number of contributing uh, affiliated faculty in related departments who are offering overt coursework. Um, and, and one or two of them will speak uh, today before we're done. Um, and, and so the, the multidisciplinarity of the undergraduate program uh, is, is absolutely sort of vital and essential in our perspective. Um, but the other thing I might just flag here um, and then segue to our next speaker is that in developing the program, uh, we, we looked at comparable programs at other liberal arts colleges. We also looked at the CDC's recommendations um, and the American Public Health Association's recommendations. And so the core for us going forward is a course that is a kind of wide introduction uh, that, that even incoming first years might take. Um, because public health may not be on their radar as young people coming out of high school and we want to catch them early. An upper division course in public health uh, ethics, which will also have uh, a, a kind of uh, community implementation dimension to it, um, and so some kind of practical work. Um, a course in epidemiology, and then one of a number of courses uh, uh, in quantitative or spatial methods. That is, we're keen to produce students who can function effectively uh, across those domains. And then a wide number of electives um, uh, coming out of a, a variety of divisions and departments uh, of the undergraduate school, um, and some of the faculty that I've shown you uh, before. Now, uh, there's a lot of academic work in, in public health. Uh, there are a lot of concepts, a lot of theories, and, and one of the concepts that uh, has come to loom large for us is this concept of community resilience. Um, and so uh, we wanted somebody who could come and talk to us about this, who's active in it. Um, and so I'm delighted to introduce um, Michael, sorry, Michael uh, Palacek. Um, you can read his bio. Um, if I had spent a bit more time on Senator Hayward's bywit, I would add that in her spare time, uh, for the, though she has very little, she enjoys reading, hiking, photography, and gardening. And the comparable information I would want to share about Michael, uh, who I credit with, with really uh, uh, calling my own attention to this concept of community resilience, um, I would tell you that in the little spare time he has, uh, he is a songwriter vocalist and guitarist um, who refuses to be uh, genre pegged. So if you'll just cover your ears, folk rock. Uh, thank you. Will you be able to... Thank you. He, he intended to say balladeer, but it just didn't come out that way. Now you have to, I'm the only one apparently that uses a PowerPoint, so I hope no one dies in the meantime. I don't think you will, but I'm it's how I think, and it also diverts your attention for me onto the slide deck. So if you just give me a second here. So I met Dr. Basu earlier this year, and we ended up over the course of the year meeting at the extension office at the tap route right down the street on State Street along with Dr. Millen. I think we mentioned public health once in passing, our conversations tended to be at a high level of dialogue and conversation based on this concept of community. What does community mean? And it was fascinating because at that point where we first met, I didn't really know what I thought about community. It hadn't really occurred to me. And as over the course of our conversations, it began to take form. What does that mean? What does community mean? So before I go any farther, I just want to make sure that you realize that I'm not representing any ideas of my employer. These are all my ideas. I'm representing my family. I'm representing the community, the place where I live. So as we go through my presentation, at the end of it, what my goal is for you to think differently. When, you, when I'm finished, I hope that you have new questions. I hope that you have new ideas that you didn't have before. It's not going to be education as much as a stimulation for thinking differently. 
I think probably my goal, and, and through the course of our conversations, what we, and I don't think we mentioned this word, but I think we agreed on one thing, is that community is about people, and it's about relationships, and it's about developing a sane society. That's really what my presentation is about. It's about resilience, but it's also about how do we create a sane society where people cannot just exist and survive, but actually excel and achieve the most that they possibly can achieve. So where do you live? Where would you like to live? As we shift away from this concept of public health, just put that away for a moment, now think about community. Community is where we live. It's the people that you know. It's the relationships that we have. What do you think about community? If it's just about policy development, implementation, don't forget that be, that is the mechanism for achieving relationships and a community that's healthy. Instead of being what 91st mayor mentioned, wouldn't it be great if this were the place that people talked about? Salem, Oregon is the place where people thrive. Shouldn't that be our goal? So as I show this slide, forget the data for a moment and think in terms of faces. Think in terms of a data point being your son, your daughter, your sibling, your best friend, your mother. It's the people. These are data points that are very helpful to create policy and implement policy. But really, these data points are individuals. 844 people died in Oregon last year. And if you were a, a CEO of a company and this were demonstrating your losses as a company, you can see from 1998, the trend is pretty clear. We're not doing very well with suicide. So I'm not gonna apologize for my lens as a nurse and for hating suicide. That's gonna be kind of my lens for this conversation. I'm gonna go back and forth on this, but this drives me, the idea of somebody at night alone thinking the only hope they have is to be dead breaks my heart. And so as a community, we have an opportunity to change the environment where people live. And that should be our goal, is to help people. So think of faces. So you see the trend here. How are we doing in other areas? So I brought this up as well. This is over the last five years. We're doing great at reducing the number of deaths from strokes. See, that's going down nicely. You also notice that bottom trend line is showing the, the, the number of homicides. And that's, that's pretty much how it's been over the past 20, 30 years. We as a society have done really good at reducing, at keeping homicides down. You see the number of people that have died from the flu, not that much. In the hospitals, we're concerned about sepsis. People dying from, it's not that, if we think of suicide, look at the difference and what we're not doing well. I'm gonna beat on that because to me, suicide is a message for something larger. It's really a message telling us that there's something not right, just as if you would see a pot of whales sitting on the beach. There's something not right in the environment. 16 young people died last year in Marion County alone. That's a football team and all their coaches. That should be intolerable. So we've done pretty well. This is a FBI, this is a, a chart of how we've done a, to reduce the number of violent crime. We have done really good with reducing violent crime. And if you're a fan of Steven Pinker from Harvard, he wrote a great book about how things really are better. We've reduced a lot of, a lot of, of, of deaths and harm that over the past years were a problem. We've done a really good job. But to me, suicide is the ultimate outcome. It tells us that Something before that suicide is not right. There's a pathology in our environment and our society that's based on ineffective relationships. And that's what community is all about. And that's what resilience is all, all about. How do we ensure that our relationships with either in the environment or our experiences or one another, how do we ensure that those are healthy and can help us advance? Well, resilience is a very powerful aspect of that but it's really based about relationship how do we do how do we create a community that has strong relationships if we were to take if we were to allow one of the gray aliens from area 51 to get out of his cell just for a few minutes and he were able to look at those data points 
and examine those data on that trend of suicides, he would probably say, stop what you're doing, it's not working. In fact, it's getting worse. That's how we should address. This should not be an academic exercise to where we improve the place where we live. We should be attacking this like a mama bear. We should be looking at all these issues because it's affecting our, the people that we know. It's affecting us. It's affecting people, not just metrics. We have social problems, and those social problems really can be resolved by a community that's healthy. This is a great comment. I love this. People are literally jumping off bridges because there's something not right internally with the relationships. It's one thing to stop them from jumping off bridges, but we got to figure out what is it that leads to this. But what's your passion? Today is really to gather people together to share a vision, and the vision is to improve where we live. What's your passion? Yeah, we're going to implement, we're going to develop, implement policy, we're going to look at best practice, but really you have to be internally driven to this. It can't be just an exercise. What's your passion? So forget my passion about suicide. What's your passion? Is it about the human trafficking that takes place? It's a horrific, horrific experience if you're a parent or you've been in that environment. Horrific. Is your interest on homelessness? Is your interest on child abuse, neglect, domestic violence? Is your passion about stopping the planet from dying? Is your passion about helping kids become successful in high school? academic achievement, because we know there's a pipeline for kids that don't do well in school, a pipeline to the criminal justice system that we would love to stop? Or is your interest just in getting that rascal stole my bike after I only had it for a week? That's one of my interests. So what we want to do is create an environment, which is the community. That's what public health is about. Public health, this idea of creating public health system is a tool to achieve that. But really, what do we want? We want to live in a place that's safe. We want a place that lives, that where we, if we've experienced past traumas, regardless of what that means to you, that we know how to interact with people, that we help people that have been traumatized in different ways. How do we care for ourselves? How do we care for others as, as our folks get older, as we get older? How do we care for one another? Well, an environment should support that. How would an environment be that was so powerfully healthy, healthy that all we did was sit around and create, get new ideas, invent things, discover? Wouldn't it be great? Well, I got to tell you, there's people, a number of people in our community that do not have that opportunity because they live in a place that's not safe. They live in a place that does not allow you to create in a free will. We want to evolve. That's what I want. I want to live in the same environment to where we evolve as a society and we do better and everybody reaches their maximum potential. So who are we missing? Is it possible that we're missing a voice? If we don't have all the voices, if we don't have all the information, we're going to make inaccurate decisions. We're going to implement incomplete policy. Space shuttles will fall out of the sky if we don't have all the information. Diversity is really about how do we have it, and it's the idea of diversity and resilience, it's not just being nice, oh, let's include everybody. It's not, a, it's not a gratuitous action just to make sure that we all get together. It's a self-protective measure. What if you don't know what you don't know? How are you going to know that? Do we minimize the role of a 16-year-old girl? Do we minimize the voice of somebody who drives a bus? Do we minimize the voice of a custodian? Who are we missing in this idea? Since we've gone, I'm not talking about public health, I'm talking about how do we develop community. We really need a complete picture or else we will not be successful. We'll make incomplete decisions. So this is what I think. I think there's a tripod and we're doing really well. I look in the audience, I know a few people, I know Allison and I know, I know, my, I know a few people from my experience, but really I don't know very many people at all. I have a very limited vision of what it contains. But what I do know is that typically the general public is not involved. I don't think we know how to include them very well. I think that's, we have to figure out some process to get input from mom who's up all night because she's terrified her kid's gonna kill himself in the middle of the night. Or, or there are or somebody who's, who's 
brother is homeless, how do we help them? Because those are the folks that don't get the support that they need. We can say, oh, we have access to health care. Oh, we have access to this, but really is it available? Whose voice do we need to hear in order to make sure that the policies that we develop and implement, the practices, are accurate? We need to somehow figure out how to include those folks. So I'm going to go back to my uh, suicide prevention piece. Now, I work with the, uh, I'm the president of the chapter of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. We're the largest organization that supports suicide prevention in the United States. We fund tons of uh, projects. One thing that we did three years ago is we went to one of the prisons and said, hey, can we come in to the prison and do a walk? They said, that's weird. Why would you want to do that? Well, we ended up doing it. This year we had six walks in six different prisons. So you could see me. I'm the bald guy with the dark shirt on this bottom one here. You might notice me in there. As I walked around the track with these guys on this walk, I had a number of guys that stopped me. Number one, they would thank me. Thank you for coming here. Suicide is big on my heart. I lost my friend or I lost my son. But what one person said, and more, more than one person said, but this one person said specifically, I'm scared of getting out because I'm not going to have an opportunity to do any. I'm scared I'm going to get out there and not have the support that I need. There are people in prison, and you can see all these guys, they raised thousands and thousands of dollars and walked with us to support suicide because the community is an alien place to them. They're not welcome there. There are a number of guys in there that could contribute to our society and our community. Have we addressed that issue? People are the currency of our community. We have to somehow figure out to include everybody in there. So what does it look like? Now to me, I think there's public agency, there's civic agencies. Those are the folks that create a, a, structural, a structure, a foundational structure for the public to be able to live and excel. And so what does that mean? I, I've listed a few things. I think we need to raise awareness. Do people know that there's a huge human trafficking problem? We know there's a homeless problem. There's awareness, there's education, there's support for caregivers. There's a couple of elements that I think in a community that have to happen. And, and I think that's one of the important things with making sure that the university liberal arts curriculum and thought comes into this play because they're going to be thinking about what best practices are and being able to bring in what's, what's the best way we can approach this now. Because a lot of us, we just have to perform. We don't have access to that information. We have to rely on academia to discover and to articulate and disseminate information that's right. So our practice improves, and what we know is right. So I'm really excited about this connection between the university and practice. So as part of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, these are some of the things that we have done to expand the capacity of the community to respond to suicide particularly. And as I said, I want to stop suicide, but really what I want to do is I want to address all the the causal factors. What are the things that lead somebody to think they have to die by suicide? So what have we done? We've, every year, we're having an out of darkness walk. Ours is tomorrow, be it capital steps. Raises awareness, but also brings people together that suffer. The Mid Valley Suicide Prevention Coalition is focused, it's, a, it's an organization of businesses, particularly the Marion and Polk County got together to create educational opportunities for um, gatekeeper training so that you, anybody, just like CPR, can address and respond to somebody who might be at risk and get over that moment of crisis and help them to get help. Lending Consulting is providing some trauma-informed care education. Being trauma-informed helps you interact with people that have experienced trauma in the past. It's a very important foundational approach to thinking about working with people, talking to people that struggled in the past. NAMI and the VA, the National Association of uh, Mental Illness and the VA have support groups. Um, we have a survivor day where we get together to support people that have lost someone. Salem-Kaiser School District is uh, starting to implement policy for suicide prevention. What does that require? Well, it requires community help. So that is a powerful program because we know that one out of five between 18 19 percent of the eighth and 11th graders have reported that they have con seriously considered suicide in the last 12 months did you know that go to a high school every fifth kid that you look at has seriously considered suicide in the past year that to me should make people afraid we have to address that and this policy development is a, co a culmination of of a lot of work of a lot of different people in, in collaboration and it's going to make some changes i think in the schools 
what else? We have strong families, resilient communities. I'm going to show you a slide on that in a minute. We also have the Mid Valley uh, Community Connections. One of the problems that I've seen in the community is that we don't all know what each other is doing. There's not a good connection. I'm always hearing, really? When did that start? I didn't know that happened in my organization where I work as well as community. We're not very well connected. There are so many resources. There are so many powerful people in our community that have developed great programs. We are not well connected. And so I was talking with somebody from the Robert Woods Johnson Foundation, and they said, hey, we have sponsored this organization that have created a networking tool to facilitate the connection of the community. So it's not just programs in their silos that are doing great work. It really encourages that connection. So if you bear with me, I'm going to step into anxiety land here and see if I can find this. I'm going to show you what it looks like. So this, is, uh, this application has a number of different options. And there's, it's not like Facebook or LinkedIn where it's really an excuse to generate income. This is specifically to share what each community across the United States is doing. Now, it started out with ACEs, which is Adverse Childhood Experiences, those traumas that youth experience as they grow up that impact their later life. But it also talks about the concept of toxic stress, how that impacts us as a community, and how do we create communities that are resilient. So there are a number of approaches to do that. One is that you can list different communities across the United States. You can map what people are doing. Um, you can bring uh, video and all kinds of resources. But what I wanted to show you is that I just, I thought that it might be interesting to start one, so I built one for our community. Now, Washington County is the only other community in, the United States, in, in Oregon, I think, that, have, that has applied this. I'm going to just show you real quick the community that, um, that they've started. I think it's run by Amy Baker. who's done great work. Uh, let's see. Mid-Valley, that's ours. I'm going to show you Washington County really quick. This is a mechanism to keep people together. I see each organization has a calendar, but this is sort of a centralized a place where everybody can get together and make sure that we all know what each other's doing. So you have a blog function, you have a calendar function, but there are constant blogs from across the United States that are showing up to tell you what they're doing in other areas of the United States. So it helps us connect within our community as well as getting new information and finding out what's going on across the nation. So this tool is very, I think would be very helpful, be something to consider. And uh, I'm going to jump back into my section here. I'm going to briefly mention last month, this uh, group group of folks got together in community and said, we need, to create, we need to apply a model. If you don't have a model, then you end up reinventing the wheel, or you end up missing something. So there are a number of community development models across the United States. They landed on this one called Resilient Communities, which came out of George Washington University, I think. And it was sponsored by Salem Kaiser Foundation, as, as well as Mountain West Investment Corporation, community, uh, Catholic Community Services, and Liberty House. And they got together for a day, and they started to create a framework for how they can implement this model of, re, of a resilient community to expand the capacity of the community to work together to address some of these social issues. And that was, this is really what TARS was. Let's get back to this. What I'd like you to take away is think about how you think about this concept of community. It's sort of a meta thinking thing, probably a better word for it. How do you think about thinking about? Yeah, what do you think about community? What do you think about? Well, I want you first and foremost to think that the goal should not be to create simply more policy, more programming. We'll never have enough psychiatrists. We'll never have enough cops. We'll never have. We as a community have to respond together as a community. And being resilient, resilient as a community is part of that. The other part is connection and relationships. How do we do that? So think internally. What's your passion? How can you participate outside of your role? You have a job. Do your role. But be driven by that internal piece so you can look beyond that. Look to people's faces. What are you willing to do? What are you willing to connect with? What are other communities doing? Bring back what other communities are doing so we can add to what we're doing. We should never be a silo. And I'm going to bring this slide up for all the academics that want to check my formatting skills out. It's APA. 
Thank you. I'd like to thank Dr. Basu, Dr. Miller, and the thought leaders at Willamette University, because this is really about creating the future, and I'm so excited about the future. Thank you very much. All right, if you refer to your program, we are um, still kind of on schedule, um, which is pretty amazing. Um, so what we propose is um, you've got a few minutes, maybe take five minutes to stretch, go to the bathroom, get coffee if you haven't been, uh, do some deep breathing, roll around on the floor, find a stretch that works for you, um, come back to the table. Ideally, the table would be socially engineered to be diverse. Um, um, and then begin to have this sort of conversation that, that uh, Michael has, has uh, prepped us for, which, which is to think creatively about, uh, you know, what have we been doing well? What's the work we could still be doing? Oops. Um, um, and I, uh, we would be interested actually in knowing, you know, what do you think about uh, virtual forms of connection? I mean, is that a creative strategy that might enable uh, sort of uh, greater integration? Um, you will see on your tables there is an orange sheet. And so one of the things that you might do in the, in, the, in the sort of small bit of break time that I'm now consuming is to jot down your own ideas before you start uh, talking to one another. Um, and as with most of the paperwork here, we'd like to collect everything because the, you know, there may be some snippet in there that, that will be an aha moment for us. So get up and walk around, go to the bathroom if you need to, uh, start musing on paper in reaction to anything that you've heard so far. We're keen to know what's been working. Uh, as a community, what could we be doing more about? Are there connections that we're missing making? Could we make them? How would we do so creatively? Thank you so much. And so uh, just start talking at some point. I'm giving you four minutes now, four minutes. Sammy and I were able to walk around some of the tables and we heard some amazing suggestions and collaborative ideas and whatnot. And so we want to take the next, what is it, 15 minutes? Highlights? Yeah, 15 minutes um, to hear highlights from the different tables, okay? And we're going to start uh, with Gabe over here, uh, who introduced himself as a model and tell us some of the things that he was sharing with our table. Speak into this microphone. Just for the record, I did not volunteer. She volunteered me. <laughs> uh, my name is Gabe Ben Musa. I'm a Deputy Fire Chief with the City of Salem Fire Department. I oversee uh, training and emergency medical services. Closer? I don't like mics. Um, so she asked me to share uh, on the local successes I can talk about our experience as a fire department as a emergency medical services provider working within the community uh, CPR in schools we have a, a very strong program here with Salem Kaiser we uh, teach CPR to eighth graders uh, last year I think we're, we're at about maybe entire 13,000 something like that so far uh, we've had some success stories where 12 year old saved his dad's life um, and actually, that was really a cool story. Um, so our efforts are um, having an impact. Uh, the other thing we do is AEDs in the community. I encourage you to download uh, Pulse Point on your phone. It will actually show you where the closest AED is. It will tell you how to do CPR, but you also can avoid those traffic jams due to accidents because you'll know where the calls are because it tells you where all our calls here in Salem. Um, so that, those two programs have been very successful, but we could not have done it without, yes sir? Uh, automat automated external defibrillator, so you can shock somebody. And it tells you how to do it, so minimal training, but we're happy to come to you and do training for you if you, if you like. Um, but we, couldn't, we could not do that without uh, some community partners. I would cite Salem Health is a biggest supporter of what we do. Uh, they provide us with grants to get AEDs, to get them installed free in, in um, a lot of uh, businesses around town. And that's why um, we update the AutoPulse um, application and you can see exactly where the AEDs are located. So, and if you're trained in CPR, you can sign up and you can get a notification when there is a cardiac arrest nearby. So our goal is to improve our community survival rates for cardiac arrests. Um, and we're getting there. 
uh, the current challenges, future challenges I see, I'm, again, I want to speak from the heart because I think uh, to tie into what Michael talked about, suicide, um, suicide amongst first responders is very rampant, PTSD. Uh, just last, last week, Washington State lost two firefighters within a week to suicide due to PTSD. I experienced some of that myself, been 20 years in the service. Um, what else? Cancer prevention and wellness. Again, we're 9% uh, more than the general population susceptible to uh, getting cancer. And we have a lot of firefighters dying from cancer. So, uh, what else? Local opportunities, community paramedicine. We're looking at that, providing community paramedicine to our community outside of the emergency medical services. Uh, creative strategies, uh, public health for the homeless population and camps, uh, studies for PTSD and first responders. It would be cool to have something local come out of this program. So that, that's all I have. Thank you, Gabe. Um, that was comprehensive, thank you. Uh, we were looking uh, for highlights. Uh, if anybody from this table or this table would like to share something with the rest of the group that you discussed. And you introduce yourself first. Or any table. <laughs> Hello, my name is Amrit Ubi. I'm a student at Willamette University. I'll speak into the mic. Um, so we talked a lot about just what tutoring and sort of peer mentoring opportunities we could make of this, of this new um, program. We know that we offer things like mosaics, but it's more targeted towards students who are disadvantaged, marginalized, and we're wondering if there's possibility to expand something like that. And we also talked about the possibility of like through something like this program to create internship opportunities, and I think that's where our conversation sort of ended. Uh, the, our next table discussion will be about internships and volunteer positions and that sort of thing, so we're going to go there. All right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Greg Walsh. I am the City of Salem Emergency Manager. At our table, we have some public health uh, folks as well, so we talked a lot about uh, some of the different aspects of uh, more emergency management type things, including the community emergency response team, so that training that gets the neighborhood and the community involved. The mayor was here earlier, and one of the things that we're working through is the mayor's resilience task force. And a big goal of that is actually reaching 50,000 people over two years with some level of preparedness training. So preparing the individual, reaching that prepared mind, and getting people to think about that, and what type of disasters you may face, and how do you personally overcome that? Because in an event like Cascadia, it is going to be a very difficult situation for a lot of people. And if people haven't thought about it beforehand or prepared, then it's going to be much more difficult. On a regular basis, I ask people if they know, if I say Cascadia, do they think about an earthquake? And about 25% of the people I ask have no idea. So it's an awareness campaign too. So that's one of the big things. Um, we talked about... Um, one of the current and future challenges is um, engaging more culture brokers. Because there's so many different communities, there's so many ways and keeping things relevant to every community that we have to engage. So one of the things that we talked about was it would be amazing if everybody knew who was in their neighborhood. And the State Office of Emergency Management is revamping their uh, Map Your Neighborhood program with the intent to actually engage people with some life skills and bring communities together for something. And one, one example of this that we talked about briefly is canning. So could we get communities to come together and can and learn that as a skill for preparedness? And one of the great things that uh, was brought up at our table is that we have to also make sure that that's relevant. If you can beets, there are portions of the community that won't, can't, won't eat beets. They'll be like, what do I do with this? Uh, so making sure that it's relevant and culturally relevant and make sure that we engage the appropriate culture brokers, the people in that community that lead, match what their goals are, not just force ours on them. Really have to make sure that we flip that perspective to engage that community effectively. Thank you. How are you getting the 50,000 people that you intend to train? Uh, mostly looking for groups and organizations that will volunteer to train their organizations. So we have, uh, I actually, yesterday was at the lottery, uh, so I went and trained at the lottery. 
uh, a lot of their employees. Uh, next week I'm going to the Oregon State Police Barracks and training there. We have other organizations like Safe Corporation Insurance. We're doing it there for their employees. So there's a lot of other groups and engagement. So if anybody is looking to help or wants to engage and have their community go through a preparedness class, uh, I do a one hour preparedness class all over the place on a regular basis. Um, and I'm happy to share that presentation with you. Just you can do it with your organization and send me the numbers so I can count them. Um, or I'll come out. I'm happy to come out. This is part of my job. I am the emergency preparedness manager. That is my official job title. So getting people prepared is my job. And it's the lifestyle that I live. Hi, I'm Heather Slahaley. I have a private mental health practice here in Salem. Um, but our table, we really focused on kind of piggybacking on that community and the need to increase community connections, social support systems for people in the community so that we're not just treating one portion, we're treating like the whole picture, um, really focusing on decreasing stigmas, but also having everyone feel like they are engaged and have people that they can fall back on and have support. Hi, I'm Diana Dickey. I'm with Marion County Public Health. Um, one of the things that we talked about here, and I, I shared um, in our clinic, we this is unscientific data we've been collecting, but we took a look at um, the immunization clients who have come to us over the last six weeks. Most of those are parents bringing their kids in um, for school shots. And um, we went through um, all of the paperwork that they filled out. And on the paperwork, when you come in for getting shots, we have a question about um, if you would like um, information about local food banks. So we have a resource from Marion Polk Food Chair, and so it's just, it's right on there with the same questions like, have you had the chicken pox? Do you feel well today? Do you want food bank information? So about, I think maybe about half of the people, um, or maybe a little less, um, had asked for that food bank information, but then we tried to drill down a little bit more to see um, how many of those people who asked for food bank information had health insurance. And 77% of the people who asked for food bank information did not have health insurance. And so that just is, I mean, we're just, again, this is unscientific, but and we're just kind of starting this conversation, but um, kind of making that correlation between the people that are waiting to the very last minute to get shots for their kids for school, they don't have, health insurance, they're um, possibly food insecure, and so getting shots for your kids is probably not very high on the priority list, um, even though it's very needed. So um, it's just starting to make us think a little bit more upstream and what are the things that we can address. So um, I'm looking forward to collecting more data, maybe a little bit more scientifically, so um, we can really create some strategies to address those issues. We have some amazing students here who might be able to help with that endeavor, which leads us really nicely into our next conversation. So you see on your program, <coughs> endeavoring to run on time here, you see on your program that what we want to talk about next is preparing public health leaders for community service. Preparing public health leaders, period. Um, what does that entail? How do we do this well? How do we prepare students for navigating complex new realities? in light of changing demographics that um, Mayor Chuck Bennett spoke about, or growing inequalities that we're all very aware of, increasingly devastating climate-triggered events, uh, and other challenges we may not even foresee, how do we prepare students to become public health leaders in both the immediate term as students in the community, but then also after they graduate? So we have some notions about this, um, but we would so appreciate your ideas 
It's obvious to us and, and hopefully to you as well that preparing public health leaders is not only going to be the job of a university. It doesn't happen within, uh, solely within the classroom. Uh, our students concretize their learning so much, so much better when they're out in the community working with you and working for you. Uh, so how do we do this? Uh, what we'd like to create are more win-win-win situations where when students are well-placed, well-received, well-mentored, uh, the student wins, the university wins, the agency organization that's engaging them wins, and then the overall community wins. How do we create more of these win-win-win situations? So I think nobody has done this better in our own, in this, Willamette community than our own Professor Peter Harmer. Peter Harmer is Professor of Exercise and Health Science at Willamette, specializing in clinical health care, fall prevention, and older adults and epidemiology. He is an internationally recognized scholar in his field, former Chief Medical Officer for the United States Fencing Association, recipient of many, many nationally competitive research grants, and to be honest, uh, it would take me an hour to go through his many accomplishments. He is our university's most unsung hero. And he is going to share with you some of the amazing things that our Willamette students have already contributed to our community. So we can look forward to figuring out how to continue that and move on with more. Peter. Thank you, Joyce. Um, I'm not sure I can live up to that introduction, but I will try. Um, as the lead up to um, this section, some of the speakers have been alluding to this. What we're looking for, I think, ultimately is what we might call a mutually beneficial engagement between students at the university and the community uh, organizations uh, that can provide them with the experiences that will be the foundation for them to go on to provide uh, their professional training, graduate school, and so forth. And that's, that's a wonderful goal. The tricky part of that, um, that goal is that we have to try and find a balance between enough internship sites, community organizations who are willing to take students and give them these experiences, and having enough students to fill those spaces. We have had, uh, and I've dealt with this for a long time, uh, here and when I was a CMO for US Fencing, trying to find that balance between opportunities and resources. And that's, that's really, really difficult to do. And sustaining that is probably the biggest challenge. So we can have lots of organizations who say, we really want to have your students come in and work with us, but we don't have students who may be particularly interested in the opportunities that those organizations are offering. And so that opportunity withers on the vine. Alternatively, we have lots of students who say, I'm really interested in this particular area, but we have no organizations that um, are, uh, have capacity, for example, to take those students as internships. And so they, those students lose that, that pathway to experiences uh, moving on to professional goals. So, Initially, uh, this gathering is an attempt to build a resource pool to solve at least one half of that equation. But I would urge those of you who are here and interested in doing that to uh, not necessarily be expecting a big rush of students who are going to come in to your organization and provide you all the kind of support you need off the bat consistently year after year. There's a level of patience that needs to be involved on the organization side that says you may not get uh, as many students as you want, um, but we would like those opportunities to remain viable you know, as long as the program is here and continuing to build. The upside, of course, is that as the program continues to build, as it's done with our department, um, those relationships do get reinforced and do get stronger and stronger. And so, uh, some of the circumstances uh, that Joyce was alluding to, um, I'm also the internship coordinator for the Department of Exercise and Health Science, and we have probably 50% of our students do an internship at some stage during our program. 
and we've had them uh, go into communities, uh, so organizations across the community, doing a wide range of different types of quid pro quo service. So they're, they're getting an exposure to the work of those particular organizations while providing um, uh, labor. <laughs> and it's not just grunt labor, but you know, engaging in some very interesting types of resource development for those organizations that have been mutually beneficial. So we've had students, for example, have worked with Salem Kaiser School District doing nutritional analysis of leftover food from school cafeterias. Um, working at Salem Hospital, developing a medical, electronic medical record keeping there when they were introducing that protocol there. At Oregon State Hospital, working with the, you know, the patients there in the forensics unit, trying to develop education, oh, sorry, exercise and nutritional analyses. Um, obesity is a major problem with the patients at Oregon State Hospital because that is quite often a, a side effect of a lot of the medication that they have to take. Um, the Women's Infants Children Program, we had a student that interned there and developed a booklet that, that um, uh, was a resource that showed free or low cost nutritional and exercise options within the community for families who use the WIC program. Um, for County Fire, both Pelk and Marion and um, uh, fire departments, we have students who have done internships with them. A lot of clinical health care internships, and that's a very interesting one. We have lots of our students, 44% of our majors have gone on to graduate uh, professional training in health care, medicine, dentistry, uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and so forth. So we have a lot of students who are doing work with clinics and hospitals around the district. And that brings up a really interesting phenomena that's occurring I see this, we know this in epidemiology, but it's occurring in public health. Well, we've seen public health as being a separate entity from clinical health care. The clinical health care is focusing on individual wellness. Public health, we're looking about what are these big programs that can change resources and policies to improve the wellness of the community as a whole. And they've been sort of separate. But what we've seen over the last probably decade is a gradual melding of these things where the, we realize that the individual's health needs don't exist in the individual alone. Right? And what happens at the public health level is only effective if it can connect with the individual. And so some of the issues that people have brought up a little earlier today, so talking about sort of the social structure of health becomes an important one. And I'll give you a very quick example. Um, we think about the obesity epidemic. I said, well, why are people overweight? And you've got a, 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 a sort of a traditional mindset that says, well, because they're lazy and they don't eat well, and oh, sorry, they don't exercise, they eat too well. Uh, and so it's, a, it's an individual responsibility issue. And to some extent, that's true. But then you also look and say, yeah, but you know, I've got this person who lives in South Central LA. There are no parks. Their kids can't play on the street. There is no a grocery store that provides fresh produce, and even if they had it, they can't afford it. But there are 25 fast food restaurants within a one mile radius, and I can get a meal for a dollar. That's not an individual responsibility issue. That's not something the individual can solve in terms of de uh, dealing with an obesity issue in that population. So we've got these sort of closing the gap between that individual and uh, healthcare responsibility idea and the broader implications in terms of social structure and, and, and so forth. Um, so what we're looking for is, uh, I think, building on the potential to connect, as Joyce was talking about, uh, students, giving them a grounding in experience in these uh, community organizations uh, to help them look forward to future careers uh, that will pay back uh, to the community as a whole overall. But also the organizations are going to be getting uh, resources. Uh, it's not just you're acting out of the goodness of your heart, but there should be um, 
a payback in the sense of utilizing some of the skills that students bring to your setting to perhaps complete projects that you don't have personnel to do. Uh, things that you'd say, this would be really nice for our organization, but we just haven't had the time or whatever to do it. And our students coming into your setting can achieve some of those goals. So ultimately, I think that's where we'd like to go, and that's going to hang a lot on your willingness to take students and your willingness to uh, perhaps not be overwhelmed with students to start with, and that there may be gaps, but to, con to continue the communication with the program so that those resources stay in place. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Um, so in addition to these things that Peter has just described, I want to add uh, what students in the humanities and the um, social sciences might also bring uh, in anthropology, sociology, politics, communication, media studies, et cetera. So these students as well um, have done uh, amazing things in the community. And these are just, I'm putting this out just to give you some ideas. Uh, and then we will have uh, our career service people come up here and talk about the kind of scaffolding and mechanisms of how to make this happen for your organization if you're interested in hosting student or students. So in the humanities, we've had students conduct research in support of grant preparation. That's probably the number one thing I hear in the community that's most needed. Who has time to go out and do all the research that's necessary to win these big grants? Well, our students are taught to be uh, researchers. Um, students have analyzed demographic data, assisted in community outreach, uh, produced social media messages, designed digital graphics, researched proposed and pending legislation, planned events, worked on campaigns, produced programming for KMUZ, for CCTV, produced multimedia journalistic reports, produced multimedia materials for racial justice and refugee advocacy efforts. They've assisted teachers, they have tutored students, conducted ethnographic research, evaluated the efficacy of programs, and on and on and on. So that's just a short list. Um, it's likely that most of, this, of these students' efforts have actually worked out well. But what we would like uh, is to be even more organized, more intentional, and importantly, more responsive to the needs, the felt needs, the real needs of this community. So with that in mind, I'd like to introduce to you Mandy and Francesca, Director of Career Development, and Francesca, the Willamette Internship Coordinator. Hello, uh, we are very excited to, to tell you a little bit about the work that we do because we get to work with uh, several constituents in this room to both work with organizations to create these types of internships and opportunities and work with the students to help them market themselves so that they're competitive and ready for the internship opportunities. So I wanna draw your attention to, in your packet, you have a, a handout that we have worked to create kind of a, a spectrum of involvement. So a lot of organizations that we work with have projects in mind, some of them don't, or sometimes feel like they don't have the bandwidth to create meaningful experiences that are long-term for students in the form of internships or job opportunities. We would love to work with you in whatever capacity you feel like you could potentially offer, whether that's a job shadow, that would be one day, limited time commitment, um, some professional insight into what you do if students are curious, volunteer opportunities, part-time jobs, helping with projects, internships. Francesca runs an internship for academic credit course that we can help students obtain credit for internships that they do at your organization. And we really wanna get creative with you on how this could potentially work in your organization. On the other side of that, we will work with the students to help them be ready and compete for the opportunities, whether that is coming up with a resume that is competitive that articulates their skill set, preparing for their interview with you, or succeeding in, in the actual internship and job, or completing the course with Francesca. We offer opportunities for employers and organizations to promote their opportunities. We have events, we have job posting systems, we do a lot of advertising to students. And last year we met with over, uh, we ha hosted over a thousand appointments in our office. So we are a highly utilized office on campus. We really are actively looking to develop more 
partnerships with organizations, more partnerships with our faculty across campus so that we can be, as you stated, that hub of connection uh, so that folks have a central point that they can come to if they're looking to increase their experience and explore opportunities, whether that's with our community partners and organizations or with our students and faculty here on campus. Yeah. Our students are very interested in public health. Our students are very interested in public health. Francesca and I are both here um, for, for the day and for the afternoon. We have our cards if you want to come by and chat with either one or both of us about things your organization might be thinking about. We can help you craft job descriptions or just explore what could potentially exist for you and then help you connect to students who could help you with those projects. Thanks so much. So this last activity is standing in the way between you and food, uh, which is the problem with having activities here because they set it up and it smells really good. Um, but this is important. Uh, we would really love your uh, feedback on this. So we've prepared a prompt, the, sec the other side of this orange sheet, as you can see. Uh, and it asks, after reading the questions below, please take a few moments to reflect on your own personal experiences. Share your responses with your table, remembering that these are simply prompts to encourage your thinking and participation. Um, we are going to amass all of these and learn from them and hopefully be more responsive to your needs and how we teach our students and whatnot. So um, uh, another tw 20 minutes of discussion, a little bit of uh, going around the tables, and then we'll have lunch. Um, we're going to do the same thing now that we did previously and ask for some table input. And I had the opportunity to go around and I heard some amazing suggestions and I'm going to pick on this table first. Oh, gosh. Okay, um, I'm Susan McLaughlin. I'm with Marion County Health and Human Services and I'm the prevention coordinator there. And some of the comments that she was listening to that I was making are that often... Um, just the way that we don't recruit, I will say don't recruit in, uh, interns into the public health um, is difficult. Oftentimes they're recruited or our volunteer manager gets an application and then a random email comes out of the blue. We have the student that needs to start and sometimes if they're from OSU or Western, it's they need 40 hours a week for nine weeks. And we don't have a project for them to do specifically. So one of my excitement with this, I guess, would be that um, it would be really nice for us to be able to know we have this partnership to come to for interns. And we can look at program planning over the next two to five years and say, we need this. And maybe a, a consistency with interns can fulfill that so we don't have to hire, because oftentimes we don't have the cash to hire anyway. So um, a sustainable partnership for internships would be good so that the, what they're getting when they come to us is something that is planned and meaningful and they can actually be involved with work, um, not develop, well, what do you want to do when you get here the first day, which is, you know, that's no fun for anybody. Um, my other comment was that 40 hours a week for nine weeks doesn't really give anybody much of an opportunity to really understand public health or the way that our programs work. I was sharing with my table, we just did an assessment in our county, took us about 15 months to complete it for our community. So most of the things we do in program development are not short-term projects, they take a while. So less hours per week for a longer period I think would be a smarter way to go. So those were just a couple of my comments. Your turn. Okay. Um, and, um, Sorry, my name is Paula Boga. I am the executive director for um, the, ARC or the ARC of Oregon, which is a nonprofit organization advocating for and with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, we happen to have an intern right now who just kind of came to us out of the blue and realized we have no onboarding process, no understanding of what an internship should or shouldn't be, and so some support for organizations around what to expect and how to best support an intern, I think is really important so that we're able to provide them with the best experience um, 
to make the most of their time as well as to support the organization and the work that we're doing um, would be uh, really, really helpful. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we I had to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, gosh. Student perspective about uh, internships. Um, from a student perspective <laughs> on internships, um, I'm Risa, I'm an exercise science major. Um, and we were just discussing at first the whole like six months, 40 hours a week. And I was like, that is so unrealistic, um, especially if it's unpaid. Um, here we can get career, or we can get credit, which is really nice. Um, but having the whole like a few hours a week, 12 hours a week, you know, for 15 weeks or all year round would be very ideal. Thank you. I'm Jackie Umstead. I'm the program manager for Polk County Public Health and Behavioral Health. And what we were talking about, Joyce called it the ideal scenario, uh, but it would be an intern who's actually had an opportunity to do some research about our organization and looks at what maybe they see as a gap or they want to do some more research in, and they come in with the idea of what they actually want to contribute towards the internship versus a more generic, we want an internship and just give us whatever you have. Um, I think just speaking to what other, other people have said is we don't generally have a lot of time to um, project our projects um, necessarily unless there's something that, you know, a new grant opportunity that's coming up. Um, so just having the ability to take the time beforehand to figure out what it is they're going to do that's going to serve both their needs as an intern and then our needs as an organization. Hello, I'm Jalen Sonoda. I'm an anthropology major in the CLA. Um, so going off of some of the comments that were made at the table, one thing that we found was communication of expectations. Um, so we were talking about how if uh, an intern felt supported, um, they were more likely to feel like they could do meaningful work, give feedback, receive feedback, which I think is very important as well. So I think just like open communication pathways in like substantial ways, not just saying like, oh, you know, you can always come to me, have like set times or a set way to get feedback and to give feedback. Thank you, Jalen. I just want to add, um, how many Raise your hand if you've ever had this experience where you do a volunteer position or an internship or something of that nature. You go into the organization and you have your mentor, liaison person within the organization and they know why you're there. And then you start to work, but everybody else is sort of wondering, who are you? <laughs> have you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So, I mean, these are really quick, easy fixes uh, to, to be able to suggest to organizations. Uh, that, you know, make sure that when you have your next staff meeting, for example, that you talk about the intern and why they're there. Um, and then similarly, you know, we can provide soft skills training for our students um, and how to be in a professional organization. I'm going to put Katrina on the spot. You told me uh, when you first did your internship, you didn't know how the folders worked and the little inserts in the <laughs> folders and simple little things that we can do from our end to make their lives easier and better and then you know, obviously uh, from the uh, receiving end as well, as Paula said, the onboarding of an inter intern, what does that look like? Do we have other people who would like to share some thoughts? I think, Mandy, you're going to have the last word. I just felt like it was important that I explain we do offer some funding for internships, especially for unpaid internships through the Career Development Office. We have... Uh, over the last year, more than doubled the funding that we have available for students doing lower unpaid internships. They are for summer internships right now, but if you and your organization host summer interns and you find yourself in a position where it's either low or unpaid, that is something that we do a lot of promotion to students, but you can also encourage your student if they are a Willamette student that there are some funds available. Last year we gave away about $55,000 to 29 students and we had lots of applicants and 
because of our donors and friends of the university, those funds just continue to, to grow. And the more community partners we have and the more opportunities for students, the better stories we have to keep those funds uh, coming. So don't let not having the funds to have an intern be the reason you don't create an opportunity. Let us partner with you. Thank you, Mandy. And just a reminder of one of the fundamental core aims and goals of Marion County um, Health and Social Services is to operate through an equity lens. So just to emphasize that. Thank you. Um, so uh, I have the distinct pleasure to um, thank you all for um, responding when we reached out to you and, and taking the risk to come out and be here. Um, we, we're hoping to do more of these events going forward. Uh, I'm not sure how frequently or whether there, there'll be a lunch in future, um, but to facilitate community conversations. Um, we would love to uh, hear from you about the prospects of students uh, venturing into your organizations in one capacity or another. Uh, we would also love to know if you are uh, able and willing to maybe come and talk about the work that you do or that you have access to knowledge about. Uh, in one or other of our courses going forward starting from next spring. So uh, one of the things before uh, the, 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 you, you contemplate leaving if you're going to leave and, and not stay for lunch is that on the back of the name tag, um, so you know we standardly want name tags back because we can recycle the plastic and so on, but there's actually a tiny survey there um, and, and it's tied to your name which is on the front and so it's just two questions. Okay. If you can take a moment to complete this, that is, are you willing to come and talk informally, formally, you know, uh, uh, about your organization? We'd love to have put you on our lists. Um, and if, if you're interested in, in uh, continuing to have a relationship with this growing program, we'd also love to have that confirmation from you. Um, and so please make sure to deposit these before you leave, uh, when you leave. Um, and again, thank you for being here. Uh, one more thing. Uh, thank you. Um, so I also would like to uh, extend a grand thank you to all of you for coming out. It's not obviously that you can come on a work day like this. So thank you very, very much for coming. And thank you for uh, filling out these to the best of your ability. We will collect these and we will uh, use your feedback. And obviously this as well, as Sammy just pointed out. But I just want to say this sort of thing doesn't happen in a vacuum, an organization of, of the symposium and luncheon and whatnot. I just want to uh, thank all of the students. If you would stand, please, all the students here who helped out throughout the day. Uh, thank you very, very, very much. And of course, uh, again, I want to thank our dean, Ruth Feingel, for helping support this from the very beginning. And then most importantly, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Sandy Dubuque, are you there, Sandy? And Raina Myers, who are over here. Uh, they worked tirelessly in these last two weeks to put this together, and we're very, very grateful to them. So give them a hug on the way out, if that's <laughs> okay. Uh, and then also, of course, Ryan, uh, our IT guy, who I absolutely insisted that he stay here the whole time, because if he's not here, then everything goes awry. So thank him too. And thank you very much. Enjoy the lunch. And we hope to see you again here soon.